energy of all of us is bringing light to all the world right now. And we're bringing light to all the world right now. The law of attraction is similar to the law of love. I think that life and the world is very, very synchronistic. And realize there is no death. We are living simultaneously in many different levels. Crystal skulls are living beings. For any of us to ever think that we're the only ones here on planet Earth is about the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And remember who you are. Remember who you are. Remember who you are. Welcome, so glad to be here. We're going to be talking about sacred space, in particular, about your garden. And I'm going to give you modern and ancient ways of using sound, shapes, and colors to make your garden grow. And this was the secrets of the exquisite Babylonian hanging gardens that was one of the wonders of the world. This was also used throughout many countries, and we see it in our archaeology remains. But we're going to start off with a, a modern guy. Joel Sternheimer is a French physicist, educated, I think, at Princeton, I think, and he lives in France. And remember, you can, you can get a microscope and you can look at molecules, so you can see them breathing, and with other ways, you can come up with their cycle per second. Everything vibrates and moves. So he, can, he was able to come up with the frequencies of amino acids in plants. An amino acid is a protein builder, and they're going to have different combinations per different plants, different formulas. And amino acids for a specific species of a plant are in a certain order. And when he put them in certain orders, you know, they were songs we know. Like one was, Oh Solo Mio. <laughs> so my thought is, the musician, because I'm a musician, and I, I know I get cosmic cheating or plagiarism because I am at times given music, period. Other times I think I've composed it, and then I see all these mathematic patterns, and trust me, mm -mm, mm -mm. no, no, I was just, oh, isn't this a nice little tune? And so I know I'm influenced. I believe that musicians are influenced. And chances are that the person who wrote O Solo Mio was near the plant, who on a very subtle level below his consciousness was playing O Solo Mio. So it's a plant song. And with these amino acid songs, <laughs> He played them back to the plants and got up to 250% plant growth and resilience to drought and disease. Right there is the answer to world hunger. Right there. That is so powerful. When you play the plant song back to them, it grows bigger, it is much more healthy. 
and maybe I should come up with a CD with human amino acid songs. But this is, this is a powerful, powerful secret. Okay, and oh, and another application would be that any frequency can be undone by another. So if you have a plant that's amino acid um, um, is 10 cycles per second, and you expose it to 1 over 10, you can cancel out. 10 times 1 over 10 cancels each other out. You can cancel out and kill with this same technology. So we could replace our pesticides in this manner without the toxic effect on our environment. Okay, now next slide. Okay, just reminding you that plants love music. And I'm sure you've, almost everybody, seen the experiments where the heavy metal music kills plants and they like classical. Well, but if you studied even further, they like the ancient sound healing method. And these ancient techniques for sound healing, I spent my life and I have them available in CDs. But Ravi, uh, Ravi Shankar, he's the guy that the Beatles liked. Remember they brought in those, uh, that Hindu orchestra? Okay, this is him. And they found that plants preferred the ancient stuff even over the classical. And they prefer actually nature sounds over everything. So you can use like my Stardust CD and my Paint Your Soul CD with sacred geometry, plant sounds, and star sounds, and watch your plant growth just skyrocket. Okay, next one. We're beginning to amass scientific data. Um, we're beginning to have studies showing that seeds exposed to certain times can grow as much as three times bigger. Think about this. You can, you can solve world hunger here. Hang, eh, hens lay more eggs. They like the blue Danube. The secret life of plants describes um, different, plant, different frequencies altering the plant's um, growth in a variety of ways. And in my ancient sounds, modern healing book, I have a, an interview with um, Sri Swamiji Sakananda Ganapathy, a Hindu master. He's a Brahmin, or um, um, high up in the pecking order, and he's ascended master on earth. Um, his major healing element is music. He'll go to a concert, and he often starts out with this little crystal wand, and he closes his eyes, and I always want to bust out, and who are you going to call? You know, the ghost, plus, you know. <laughs> so anyway, and, but I believe what he's doing is he's closing his eyes, and he's seeing colors, and the crystals amplifying the frequencies from the audience, and colors will relate to different illnesses because you can go through resonance. Resonance is you have a violin here and you play the A string and a violin here, you don't play this A string. This violin causes this A string to go off. So there's energy transferring on the same frequency. So um, he's able, so if you have a heart disease, it's going to be um, an octave or it's going to um, have a, a frequency and the healing note's gonna be a C, a musical C. And so he can look at the colors and through a variety of ways, come up with music to heal the audience. It's tailored to the audience. So if you happen to come in there with a problem that's the major problem, you might leave that concert without it. I've gone into his concerts and had acupuncture treat treatments. I can feel little pins coming in my knotty points and energy flowing through. It's just unbelievable powerful. Okay, um, and he also, reports that. Um, different songs to make cow's milk sweeter and how they muse, use music for baking bread and um, their food stuff to make it more nutritious. Okay, next, next one. Okay, bird chirps. Um, Dan Carlson is a man on the West Coast and I don't know whether you came up on this or on this on his own. It is an antiquity. 
that in antiquity they would use different nature sounds to enhance crop growth. And this is what Dan Carlson's doing. I do believe he's been nominated for a Nobel Prize. I think so. He sells as a package bird chirps that are native to a plant and plant food. He discovered that the plant absorbs nutrients at different amounts during the day. It's wide open and it really sucks up the nutrients at dawn. And then as the heat of the day comes on, it only sucks up a little bit of nutrient. So he says, what time of day that you feed your plants makes all the difference in the world. And nobody wants to get up at dawn. So he sells the bird chirps at dawn. And that is the trigger that makes the plant open up wide for nutrients. So his product is a bird chirp and a fertilizer, and you do one, two. He's also getting 200% plant growth. I would, I'm, I'm just putting this out here um, because I don't have the um, music to play from YouTube. But there's this place at Damanhur, Damanhur in Spain. And they have, again, I think they've read The Secret Life of Plants. And they hook up, think of like a lie detector where you hook up little electrodes and you record frequencies. And they do this with the plants and the roots. And the plants play incredibly be beautiful music. They play music from different species and different plants. For example, one species has a different song than another. And I saw um, Damaher even has um, videos where they'll watch a plant and it sings. It does sing. It's below our hearing range, the, meaning that the, the volume's too small for us to hear. So this guy's singing a little tone and singing. And then they would show someone come up and do something like this and would go, <laughs> they would respond in sound to you loving them, to you touching them. I mean, like, whoa, <laughs> that was so cool. Then I found some other studies, very similar. There's a lot on the internet about this kind of thing. And this one was from Mexico, I think. And they did not use um, a synthesizer or a piano. Like in these, in Damaher, they're taking the frequencies of the plant and connecting it to a synthesizer or a piano. So it comes out in the equal temperament scale which is the music that we're used to hearing. If you go to a foreign country and you hear a different scale, at first it sounds kind of weird and for me, then after a while I grow to like it. But I saw some in Mexico where they, they hooked it up to a, synth a machine that had every frequency and did not use a scale. And it was like entering a different dimension. I mean, it was so other, it was beautiful. It was fabulous when you didn't confine the plant to our scale system. It was. It was like you could walk into nature and start to talk to the plants. Okay, and um, so you can check this out and listen to it for yourself. Another study, New Mexico, and they played um, tuning forks matched to the star frequencies, just like I do in here. And they had um, incredible improvement in seed germination, quantity, quality, longevity, um, pollination, plant size, and their bugs got a lot bigger too. <laughs> <laughs> I guess they liked it too. I find, I, I'll just tell you one story about this stardust. I got this testimony from someone I didn't know, and it was just funny, so I'm going to tell you. This guy writes about his bird, Jasper, and he comes home, and Jasper's on his back with his feet up. Not good. <laughs> and uh, he's not dead, though. So he cuts out, and he puts on the Stardust CD. And it's very kind of heavenly and stuff. And I guess his wife was into hip-hop, rap, heavy metal, da 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 And she did not like this genre. So they, he proceeds to tell me about this argument where she says, ah, not in this house. And <laughs> it's just no way. Anyway, they decide that Jasper gets a half hour to die 
and he can listen to the stardust, the, the star frequencies. And they must not have been too excited because they went in and watched TV. And in the half hour, Jasper was flying around. And he was allowed then to watch the, listen to the whole CD. <laughs> and it's the star sounds. It's the star sounds. Okay, next slide. Sing to your garden. In ancient times, in almost every tradition, music and your garden were hand in hand. Not only does your plant sing, but your plant likes singing and it likes music. I want you to think of the soil and think of a little seed in there and it has to germinate. So it, it's like, think of it like an egg. You know, the hen lays an egg and the chicken eventually has got to form and then shake and vibrate enough to break out of that shell. So think of that like a seed. What they would do is that they would do a lot of drumming circles. So let's say you're planting into the ground. They're going to dance, which is going to shake the ground, and they're going to have drumming circles. They're going to vibrate that seed. And by having the seed germinate earlier, it has a longer growing period. Um, and you see pictures where they're using trumpets and different instruments, and they're using them like, like water pistols, and they're pointing the sound and the vibrations into the soil to enhance the crop growth. Group, growth. Um, and again, they would do it a large amount because sound is subtle energy. So they would do it, and they, they had done this a tradition, so they would do it certain long periods of time to, um, to get the crop growth that they were looking for. The rocks also absorb the sounds. So you got a rock, and, and most of you have had crystals, and you can feel the difference between one or the other. And if you take a Carillion photography of this and play my Stardust CD, you will see the before and after aura of this crystal. It is much better after listening to the star tones in the, in the, the beautiful music. So you can do Carillion photography and watch a rock absorb energy. Think of a crystal like a computer. It receives information, stores information, and can project it out. So they would have certain songs or certain dosage or they would put certain rocks that have certain frequencies in different types of garden. And we'll get into more of that. Okay, next slide. Well, here I'm just talking about flower frequencies. When you play a frequency to a plant back to itself, of course, it's going to enhance that, that growth. And this is 12 flowers. It is the vibratory energy of a flower. I'd like you to think of the plants and the flowers as not just our garden, but our healers. The tradition of flower remedies came from a man called Edmund Bach, a, med a doctor in England, who was fed up with the medical profession because he was tired of giving people drugs. And one of his secrets was, is that he would put his hand over a plant or a flower and he was very sensitive. So he would feel how this felt. And with different species, you got different feelings. He then matched the species with different emotions. And we do that unconsciously. Um, there's flowers at a funeral to lift the grievers, because they depart a beautiful healing energy. It's subtle. You know, if you're in love with someone, they're roses for the beauty. Whereas if someone's depressed and sick, sick, daisies or cheerfulness might be a really nice selection. If somebody's depressed, the frequency of cheerfulness is the antidote. It's simply a matter of quantity. And we're not aware that we're not one with our environment. We're not aware that we ingest our flowers on a very subtle, slow, but continuous basis. These are our healers. So here's 12 flowers that correlate to your emotional body and have incredible healing value. Okay. Ancient masters, this would be Atlantis, early Atlantis, 
were telepathic and talked to their plants. They would ask the plants what shape should their garden be and many other things. So, this is a skill that we still have today. We've forgotten that we have it. So we have two plants here. And this little guy is a little sick. All righty, so I'm going to set them here. Put some crystals around them. Now, I want you to tell me what does that, what he, what does that, what feelings do you get off of that plant? Happiness. Yeah. Did he like being picked up? Yeah. Anybody else? Does he need water? Pity. Yeah, I think so too. I'm just checking my feelings. I'm connecting with the plant. It's quantum entangled. I'm entangling with his en energy through my intent and imagination. And I'm checking my own feelings to, because the re he's resonating. And somehow or other, I want to call him he back to me. So anybody else, what does this guy feel? I think he likes being next to his friend or companion there. Very good. So anybody can't do that. Just check your feelings after you connect with your intent with the plant. Let's all bless him. What does this guy have to say? I'm really thirsty. He's thirsty? <laughs> <laughs> what else? Water. How happy is he? Uh, he might be a little happier now he's next to the Yeah. Body, Tell me. He Does he like this? Can you feel that? Can you feel that? This one green leaf. Can you feel any pain in him? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I can. Close to that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, he also sits in a healing space, so there's that potential that he gives off that healing energy to bless others. On others. So. And in the lore from Atlantis, the plants would often offer themselves for that purpose, for everything is conscious. So the, the plant would have a group soul and if it were to offer itself as healing and sacrifice itself, the evolution of the plant in the group elevates. So that's a possibility. And just because he's been so good, not that I don't love him, but I'm gonna, ho I'm gonna hold him for a little bit. Okay. Now, let's ask, we'll ask this guy, because he's more healthy. You tell me, does he like that crystal? Let me try another one so you can see the difference. Does he like that crystal? Does he have a preference? Check your feelings. How do you... All righty. All righty. So you can have your garden. And everyone here, we have this ability. We had it in ancient times. We can communicate with our plants and ask them what they want. Some of the things that they wanted was the shape of their garden. Again, shapes create very subtle energy. Sherry Edwards, and I talk about her in my Secret Sounds Ultimate Healing book, can hear frequencies that you can't, like cell-to-cell -cell, um, communication or oat acoustic emissions out of your ears. So with this ultra sense of hearing, she can hear shapes coming out of 2D drawings. A Templar's chorus, when drawn on a piece of paper, always sounds the same. So the ancient symbols and talismans are emitting a frequency. And any shape that has a pattern commonly found in nature 
is going to be ultimately healing to us because it's God's blueprint. So, um, lots of times you can experiment and see that plants, like a lot of plants, like to be grown in a five-pointed star. Um, I have a girlfriend who has remembered a lot of the um, dynamics of the, the hanging gardens in Babylonia. And it was done through communication. The other thing is that they like certain energy. This is like scotch tape with copper on it. I got it at a company that sells supplies to make stained glass lamps. And you put this on the glass before you solder it. And you could easily make a shape with something like this if your plants prefer to shape because a certain shape of the actual size of the garden is going to make a difference. And of course, one of the ones that's not very good for it is the square. Very few like the square, which is what we normally do. They asked other things. They asked when they wanted to be planted. Um, root vegetables like the full moon and tomatoes prefer to live alone. And then you can ask them, like we did here, what stones they like. My girlfriend, who's recreated these gardens, her name is Basheen Baker, and she runs the NITE school in Mount Pleasant, Michigan. And she has gardens. Many of them are stars. And she puts metal, which is a good conductor, like little, I don't know, sticks. And then she asks the plants what, what stones they want. So she creates little energy lines. She does it with stones and metals. And she does it in cooperation with the plants. Incredible garden growth. Absolutely phenomenal. Okay, um, next slide. Boji stones. In many um, archaeology shows, they'll show you these round stones that they're judging to be many thousands years old, and they're just kind of hanging around. The reason why they're fascinating is that they're perfect. I mean, they're thousands of years old, they're perfect. And um, how could someone 2,000 years ago have done this? It had to have been some machine. It couldn't have been done by hand. It's so perfect. But what, what it is, is that many plants like round stones. They're, they're, they're good for crop growth. That's why they're kind of hanging around. And they even had male and female varieties. Male had little protrusions. And um, so they, they would ask the garden what they wanted to benefit crop growth. OK. Um, I'm going to go back into the shapes of nature. The five-pointed star that um, my friend uses in her garden does occur in nature. If you trace the path of Venus over an eight-year period time, she will create a perfect five-pointed star in the sky. And so the five-pointed star is also associated with Venus. And in the pyramid, you'll note that their, their height to, um, you know, perhaps perimeter relationship will be the same as the Earth, the ratio of um, the size of the Earth to the moon. I mean, they have the, all these kind of correspondences in the building. They're using different um, dimensions, frequencies, and shapes found in nature in the building to make the building powerful so the people in and around the building are lifted up and empowered. They're in the building a lot of times, so they're constantly absorbing the energy, something that we're totally unaware of, and it makes a difference. Yet we all know this because we always have places we like to go. Have you ever been in a cranky person's house and how, mm, you know, we all feel it, so we're aware of it. So I'm going to tell you this little story here, and this is um, just showing you nature's patterns and how it, how it works. Um, there was a study by MIT. I think it had like a dozen of their brightest and best. Their job to manufacture spider silk. 
Spider silk is legendary, smooth, silky, and really tough. So all of our brightest and best made silk after silk after silk, synthetic silk, and they were all strong, but they, every time they touched it, it fell apart. They couldn't get it to adhere. They had a musician in the group, and he, like our Sternheimer, started analyzing the frequencies within the spider silk. And he found, lo and behold, they're musical. They're beautiful when you listen to them, the spider silk. Then he used, like reverse engineered that, so the next sample that this group of um, highly touted scientists came up with, it was composed and synthesized in such a way that it made beautiful music. Voila, it worked. Powerful, soft and silky. The secret? Music, numbers, sacred geometry. So when you sing to your plants, what are you, what are you doing? When you sing to yourself, think of yourself as a temple. When you sing in your home and have beautiful music in your home to uplift, what are you doing? You're enlivening, you're making it healthy, you're improving your body, mind, soul. Woohoo! And here's another point. These ancient temples, I know we say the thousands of years, but there's actually studies coming out suggesting they're older. The Sphinx, for example, in Egypt has um, water erosion at some point in time that it was perhaps in a swamp, making it maybe 10,000 years old, maybe. So what building do we have today is going to last 200 years, let alone 10,000? None. But it's like the spider silk, see? These ancient buildings have all the sacred geometry. And all the sacred geometry is in almost all of my CDs. I have silent sacred geometry, meaning nature shapes. This one has audible um, frequencies associated with the spiral found in the galaxy in a seashell. Um, these have star sounds, but they all have sacred geometry in the background. Very subtle, tiny. Okay. This is just showing one little itsy bit thing of one pyramid. Here's the Great Pyramid at Giza. And look how harmonious that is with the earth and the size of the earth and the moon. All of their buildings have these kind of correspondences and shapes found in nature because it's healthy, it's vitalizing. And remember when you read these really old stories, everybody's always perplexed, even the Bible. They talk about so-and-so living 300 years. They're living long lives. They're, um, they're using sounds to tune their organs, like, like in my deep wave body healing. They're using these ancient techniques um, to uplift and bless themselves and their world. Okay, next slide. Star energy is really good, and I've done that in my Stardust CD. There's sounds of the orbits created by the planets. Very healing in, in a variety of ways. The ancient people would not only play music linked to the stars, but they would try to emulate the shapes of the stars in their building alignment. They did it such that at powerful times of the year, which would be an equinox, um, that the stars came on the altar. So in other words, it, it gets to soak up that powerful energy. Or that a certain constellation would shine down a shaft. Like I think one of the pyramids has Leo, would have had Leo at that point in time, shining down that shaft onto the body of the Pharaoh. And Leo, of course, a powerful lion. Um, they were into power in Egypt. So one way that they would link to stars and constellations would be to focus on allowing that starlight in the building, in the stones, so that people during the day could be blessed by it. Another way they did it, and I see this to be a little flaw, but who am I again? I guess maybe I need to learn more. They would see like, like the Pleiades a constellation, draw lines between it, and then their buildings are going to have that exact same shape. The reason why, I, because shape resonance. And the reason why I say that's a little flawed is because, of course, they're seeing a 2D view of it in space and Earth is curved. But apparently, they did it all over the globe. And I'm going to give you another example of shape resonance. When I was working on my, um, the Lost Ways of Time book, 
with the vibrational energy secrets from all these ancient cultures. Um, I was a little, I don't know, judgmental, and I'm not proud of that in the beginning, as I read these ancient documents, because they just sounded stupid. <laughs> and um, later on, I, I think I've decided it was perhaps me who was stupid. And I'll give you an example. In Egypt, one of the healing modalities for a cracked skull was to sleep with an ostrich egg. So you can see why I was kind of smirking at that one. But in a shape creates a frequency. And the ostrich egg is about the same size as your skull. So in order to have your skull be whole, it needs to have a certain resonant frequency. And having that ostrich egg nearby, you're going to start to download the frequency of a healthy skull. They were using resonance. And when I finally got that, aha, I got it, I got it. Um, it helped me understand another thing from the Egyptian mysteries. One of the, the duties of one of their doctors, they had doctors, priests, and magicians that kind of worked as a team. But one of the duties was, if somebody's injured, injured or hurt or sick, the doctor would come in and say, eh, eh, you know, like off to hospice or you get medical care. At first, I was like horrified. I kept thinking of concentration camps where who gets to live, who gets to, I was just appalled at that. But then it dawned on me, all of their healing modality is subtle energy. So it takes time. So if you're going to die in an hour or two, there's no sense sticking an ostrich edge by your head because that's not enough time for you to get the required dosage to heal. They didn't have the methods to heal like that. They were subtle energy and you ingested it slowly and surely. So they were saying, we have something that can help you. That's all. Anyway, I learned from that. But likewise, these people are aligning to different star systems. When you really get back into these legends and stories, they're all from a different planet. So there's a group in this area, and they say they're from Pleiades or Orion or um, whatever. And um, I just have a little interesting thought about that. If you calculate the orbit frequencies of, let's say, Pleiades, what are some of the popular ones? Octorians, um, Sirius, Orion, so yeah. You, you look at their frequencies and they all have a complementary color or they're also a balancing frequency with Earth. They're, we're in like, um, a, think of a, see, a, a, a seesaw. It's like if we're not healthy, they're not healthy. We got quantum entanglement going on with those systems by the orbit speeds of our bodies, of our planets. So that might be one reason why we work with the Pleiades and not some other star system that we're not familiar with. Just a thought. Okay. They wanted to receive the energy of their star of origin. They believed that when they were in these other planets, they were not so involved in matter. They weren't in 3D. So just think of the elves, think of the fairies, think of the ascended masters and angels. I mean, they were a higher vibratory being, they believed, in these other planets. So they would create the star sounds, listen to them, create them in shapes, put them in jewelry or something, and they would slowly ingest the frequencies of their home planet to empower, to reboot, to energize, to reorganize, to return to their divine blueprint. Okay, I guess that's that one. And then also, um, we, we had talked about um, there are sounds and there are other videos, so I'm not going to do it here, but there are uh, sounds that they would associate with the planets and they would do planetary chants and they would do that for their crops and they would do that for um, reconnecting to a star cluster and um, energizing. Okay. Alrighty. I'm just going to show you another energetic technique of the ancients. Well, I'm going to show you two. But I need two volunteers. Can I have two volunteers? 
Okay, we got one. Okay. All righty. I'm going to show you that sound makes etheric connections. We had talked about an instrument almost like being a water pistol, and it could like link energy. So what we're going to have you two girls do is just sing any old note back and forth to each other, like, ah, uh, but before we do it, before we do it, this is a dowsing rod, like a water dowsing rod. And so there's no water stream under here because there is no etheric energy making this dowsing rod go right or left. Okay, so now we're going to sing like anything, like they're just, ah, uh, and you do the same. Ah, ah, ah. Okay, cool. Now, I'm going to go around about where you were. Look, I can't pass. You built an etheric wall of sound. So this would be another way they would put sacred shapes in their gardens. Yes, and also they would use it, the Egyptians would use it like if they had a mat, you know, scorpions or, or nasty ants or something. They would sing in a circle around their sleepy mats um, because this certainly is not going to, this wall is not going to stop a human, mm -hmm. but it might an ant or a scorpion. Charm circle. <laughs> okay. Now, you can do a topographical map of your yard. You'll find that history has occurred at different spots long before you. Like I had a spot in my garden that never grew anything. And I, I just did a, um, a channeling one time and I saw an Indian woman giving birth and dying at childbirth. And I, and I worked with her and sending her energy back to the light and restoring the energy in that area. Beautiful garden now. But it had a memory that was many hundreds of years old and it was affecting my plant growth now. The more I lift my energy, my space, the more it impacts me, we're not separate. So I heal my garden, my garden heals me. So one way of doing that is have the intent to have your dowsing rod show you negativity. And I don't know if we have any because we had a spot before and we cleared it and we don't have one. But um, it probably is going to stay cleared, but I don't know if removing the crystals will make a difference. It could. It could. Good idea. Excellent, excellent. That plant is creating a spot of negativity. And as you said, maybe it's volunteering to absorb healing energy, so we don't want to judge the plant, but, the, but it's not in a good spot. So what the ancient people would do is, again, they would talk to the plant or they would use, they would use crystals and they would go over every foot of their yard. And those are the crystals I have. So you could have a better choice. And he's pretty sick, so we'll see if he uh, gets any better. Yeah, the crystals are helping him. See that? So you can go through your yard and douse for all of your negative spots and, and um, put a little crystal in the soil. Another thing you can do with your intent, ask for neg negative energy lines, like there's positive and negative magnetic lines. And um, whenever you have a negative one, you'll find cracked sidewalks, foundation cracks. You'll find the trees with all those gnarly things. That's a clue that there's a negative energy. And you can follow it with your dowsing rod to the beginning of your property. Take a coat hanger and make like a horseshoe and put it in your ground and you'll divert the negativity off your property and raise your sacred site or your sacred garden. There's another cute little technique. And I think that we're 
done, I think those are some of the tips for your sacred garden. There's my sights. <laughs> oh, one thing. I had a question I didn't answer. Yes, uh, basically I just wanted to know what, I have one, but what you would specifically do with it. Okay. The question is, what's the value in bowls and other um, typical sound healing devices? So I'll do this bowl. Um, remember we talked in another video about harmonics. Harmonic is an after ripple of sound. A harmonic happens with every sound. It, it follows a mathematic pattern. Sherry Edwards, as I discussed in my Secret Sounds book, was able to look at the Krebs cycle of digestion, and it has a chemical formula, and put in the sounds for the chemical and see that the mathematics worked and that it mirrored the mathematics of a harmonic pattern. Therefore, you'll find that um, your digestion is a harmonic cycle. And if you think about every sound following a harmonic pattern, surely everything in nature is going to emulate some of these patterns. When you look at your ancient sacred buildings from Incas, Mayans, Aztecs, all over, Chinese, Hindu, they're all built with dimensions mirroring harmonic patterns. If you look at the Egyptians' chant, their death chant, which there's a video out and you can check it out, it's of mine, and it it's, creates harmonic patterns for enlightenment and, and empowerment. So harmonics are pretty important. We live in a digital world. In a digital world, your harmonics are averaged. So think of a photograph that's made with slide film. Every shade of gray is in there. But if you digitalize it, it's pixelized. And depending on how many pixels is, how good your photo. But it's averaged. It doesn't have all the frequencies. Every CD you have is digitalized. Our internet is digitalized. When I want harmonics in my CDs, I have a little software program and I actually put them in sound by sound by sound by sound. Because you can't get them on a digital world. And that's our diet. So now, more than ever, listen to the harmonics. Listen to go up and pitch. Your body will pick out the frequencies that it wants. It's very healing. Now, so, we all have different composite frequencies said differently. We're all different personalities. We have different emotions, different bodies. So I might be a G, which I am. And if this bowl's a G, I might not like it. Because I already got enough G. I don't need any G. I'm probably going to pick a bowl that's a D because that's my balancing tone. So when you go to get yourself a bowl, you, you want to play it and you want to love it. Your body will tell you which tone, and it's the harmonics. And each metal, like think of your instruments. Each, a violin is wood, and a guitar is wood. It sounds different than a trumpet, which is brass. So the difference between, let's say, a French horn, brass, and a violin, is that the French horn puts all its energies in the, uh, the, the first harmonics, so it's not that high in pitch whereas a violin tends to throw its energy off into higher pitched harmonics. It, it doesn't have an even flow of energy in this mathematical harmonic pattern. So you'll find that um, different musical instruments have different harmonic patterns, and depending on your needs, you're going to like one instrument or another for its harmonic pattern unknown to your conscious mind. The Tibetans used to make bowls out of all different metals, and the Atlanteans were using, I don't know, it's like nine different metals. Each metal is going to have a slightly different harmonic pattern. And therein is the beauty. It's, it's the actual afterwave. And again, you can just be, make it simple. Your body will pick what it wants. And um, here's another example. It's a little product. And in this case, we're using real silver, silver and real crystals. I don't know if you can hear it. See how beautiful it is? That's the difference between real silver, real crystals, real metals, and fake ones. Think of your 
Okay, think of your house when we have a, a plastic chair, a metal that's had all kinds of alterations. Think of man-made things as GMO foods. Sometimes their harmonic patterns are distorted, harmful, not feeling very good. Think of being in a concrete floor, building, wall, room versus a natural log cabin. The same thing with clothes too, right? Yes, with clothes. Yes, Yes, it's the har one of the things is the harmonic patterns. So um, your question's very good about bowls or different items, the different qualities. They, they, the bowls are good because of the harmonic patterns and the pitches, of course, are very important. And each composite material gives you a different healing concoction. You know, I, I remember asking Sherry Edwards about the Riping machine because I thought that was like a you know, miracle or whatever, or even like, you know, why does she use a certain thing? And she said the, the Riping machine goes up like this. This is like an a MP3. Anything computerized is like mm -hmm. this. And it's really good for cancer, things that need to be done. Right, you know, yeah, it's a it's digital hard thing. thing. It's hard. It's powerful. Yes. But the music that plays off of anything that's natural is like a wave, and your body is this wave. So, you know, if you're going to, like, heal something that's an illness, it has to be like this, unless you have cancer. And then that works really, you know, it was very powerful. Um, or to kill a virus, it's right. good to use a digital lightning bolt. Yeah. But your body processes are analog, and they need the harmonic. They need every frequency. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, no, the, someone told me that it's really good for Lyme disease, too, the digital. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to mention, I don't know if you're familiar with this series of books um, about Anastasia, Anastasia is the way the Russians would say it, um, the cedar, Rainy Cedars books. No, I okay. haven't. She, Tell us. She's an entity, may, maybe, I mean, there's no proof, but mm -hmm. her advice around gardens and seeds was, um, first of all, she feels that everybody should be growing their own food, that we all should have a, a hectare of land to do that. And um, to take, when you're planting your seed, to take the seed and put it, let it feel your saliva so it knows the frequency of your saliva, then when you plant that seed, it will grow what you need for your body's healing. Through resonance. That's beautiful. Yeah. The Indians used to do that, too. Did they really? Corn or whatever in their mouth and then plant it down there with their bare feet go. and put it down. And cool. And even the Sufis, I'm just, I just got an image of them. Have you ever heard, seen the whirling dervishes? Mm -hmm. them, the fun with the skirts and they got the yeah. funky hats? Yeah. Well, even their hats are on, create the angle of phi, found in between the Fibonacci numbers. Mm -hmm. So they're wearing the nature sounds in their outfits. And of course, their music is not gonna be an equal temperament. It's gonna be creating phi. And then when they dance on the floor, it's like their movement is going to create shapes on the floor. And um, here's a way of thinking of phi. This is just my little imagination game. You have two seeds, a male and female, that, that are in a seed. And they each make a frequency and they combine. And the mathematics is if this one's four and this one's two, they combine and you hear the difference. But every now and then you get an irrational number. You know, it doesn't round off. And Mother Earth never rounds off. So when you look at the combination of frequencies and you finally get an irrational number, it's usually close to phi. And then the mathematics goes off and the plant goes to the right. Meanwhile, the rest of the plant's going off. And then you get another irrational number and it's gonna go off to the left. And the mathematics is that, that in the early part of the Fibonacci numbers, the early numbers, they all approximate phi, and as you get higher in the numbers, they get closer and closer. And one's over, one's under, one's over and under, and you can match it to the branching pattern found in almost every plant. Mm -hmm. So they were really big on playing phi, like my painter saw, they're really big on that sound pattern to enhance the growth. So, but thank you for that. Okay.